Hello again. We're about to start our second video on bonding. You remember last time we said we were going to be talking mainly about the intramolecular bond. That's the bond between atoms in a molecule or between ions within an ionic lattice. lattice. That's an intramolecular bond. We just got finished drawing our first Lewis structures. We drew one for H2 and one for HF. Now, uh, for H2, Remember that Lewis structure? It looked like this. We had a hydrogen atom sharing a pair of electrons. That gave them both a noble gas configuration for at least part of the time. If we take half the distance between the atoms and the hydrogen molecule, we get, oh, that's the wrong table, we get a distance of about 37 picometers. Um, similarly, similarly, if we did the same thing for two atoms in fluorine, which by the way, I'll quickly draw the Lewis structure for that. It looks like that. They also share a pair of electrons. If I take half the distance between the two nuclei of the fluorine atom, we get about 71.5 picometers. We call this the covalent radius. Now, if we add the two covalent radii together, the theoretical bond length in HF would be half the distance between, a height between hydrogen atoms and half the distance between two fluorine atoms. So we know what those numbers are. They are 37 0.07 and 71.5. If we do that, we would get a bond distance between the two of about 108.5, 108.6 picometers. So, if I were to redraw that, I would show H bonded to F, just like I did up there. And that theoretical bond length between the nucleus of the hydrogen atom and the nucleus of the fluorine atom would be about 108.6 picometers. Now that's the theoretical bond length. Here's something interesting. The experimental bond length is not 108.6. It's actually much closer together than we would expect. It's about 92 picometers, 91.7 to be exact. So why is there a discrepancy? How come if I take the distance, uh, half the distance between hydrogen atoms when they're bonded to each other, half the distance between fluorine atoms when they're bonded to each other, and put them together to form HE. Why isn't that bond length 108.6 picometers? Why is it so much smaller? The answer lies in the fact that electrons sh shared are not shared equally. Um, this I like to introduce my Barbie doll dreamhouse analogy. Let's say that we have two young girls, right? And for Christmas, they get to share our Barbie doll dream house. So here's my Barbie doll dream house. I know it's not as pretty as you'd like it to be, but that's the dream house that they get to share. And it comes with, you know, a pink Barbie doll Corvette and a hot tub and all those fun things that you young ladies might remember. Well, the sisters it's being shared between, one of them is five years old. And that's her right there. And the other one is three years old. Okay. So when they get that Barbie doll dream house, mom and dad say, well, Merry Christmas, Santa Claus brought you a Barbie doll dream house. But he left a note. He said, you young ladies have to share that Barbie doll dream house. Well, we have a five-year-old and a three-year-old. Who do you think, when push comes to shove, hopefully it doesn't come to that, but when push comes to shove, who do you think is going to be able to play with that Barbie doll dream house more often? The bigger girl or the tinier girl? If you said the bigger, bigger girl, you are correct. You are aware keenly of human nature. The older girl will probably get to play with the Barbie doll dream house a bit more than the younger girl because she's bigger, she's stronger, she's able to you know, use her authority to get that dream house away from the little sister whenever she wants. I know it's not fair. Let's not get into the debate of fairness, but try to work with me on this analogy. Now, atoms are very similar. When they share a pair of electrons, that pair of electrons is not necessarily shared equally. Make an educated guess. Which of the two atoms, hydrogen or fluorine, do you think would attract the shared pair most? If you said fluorine, you are correct. Fluorine does take that shared pair of electrons, and that shared pair spends more time around fluorine than it does around hydrogen. To show this, we draw an arrow pointing to the atom that gets the shared pair more often. And then we put a little line over the other atom. We call this a dipole. 
In fact, this diagram shows that there's a dipole in the molecule. A dipole is the result of electrons being shared unequally. The molecule, HF, is called a polar molecule because it has one of those dipoles. If those electron pairs were being shared equally, it would be nonpolar because no dipole would exist. That might be, in my Barbie doll dream house analogy, maybe two identical twins get to share a Barbie doll dream house. In that situation, we'd expect more equal sharing. However, in this situation, it turns out that the fluorine atom has a greater electronegativity, and there's a greater attraction for that shared pair, so they spend more time around fluorine than they do hydrogen. As a result, we get a dipole. If we have a dipole, the molecule's polar. Polar molecules act like tiny magnets and are responsible for many of the phenomena we take for granted, like your existence. In the case of hydrogen and fluorine, it was obvious which of the atoms attracted the shared pair most. With other elements, it's not so obvious. Once again, a quantitative relationship for this is known as electronegativity. The larger the electronegativity value of an atom, the greater its attraction for a shared pair of electrons in a covalent bond. Now, this is that table, I copied it out of your textbook for you, that shows the electronegativity of all of the elements. Notice that fluorine has an EN value of 4.0, the highest of all the elements. Now, that would be expected because its atomic radius is so small, it has a great attraction for shared pairs. Hydrogen's electronegativity is only 2.1. So, as a result, I'm going to flip back and we'll look at this structure. Since the fluorine atom gets that shared pair more often, there's an extra electron buzzing around fluorine most of the time. And so it ends up having a negative charge. And that hydrogen atom loses its electron most of the time because it's spending all of its time around fluorine, or most of its time. So that end has a positive charge. So we have a molecule with a positive and negative end that's created because of this dipole. And we call those molecules polar. So let's take a look at these examples. Let's draw correct dipoles for the bonds formed between the following atoms, carbon and hydrogen. Well, carbon's electronegativity is 2.5. I'm just going to write that beneath carbon. And hydrogen's, as we know, is 2.1. Who gets the shared pair more often? If you drew the arrow going from hydrogen towards carbon, just like that, put a little plus sign on the side of carbon or the hydrogen, you would be correct. This side would be negative, and this side would be positive. What about nitrogen and hydrogen? Well, nitrogen's electronegativity is 3.0, hydrogen's is 2.1. The difference is greater. Notice the difference here is 0 0.9. The difference here was only. 0.4. So the electronegativity difference is even greater here. Once again, we'll point the arrow towards the more electronegative element and put a little plus sign over the less electronegative element. This is the negative end. This is the positive end. How about O and C? Oxygen's electronegativity is 3.5. Carbon's is 2.5. Once again, a little bit bigger. The electronegativity difference is 1.0. And the arrow points to the 1 that's more electronegative. So this end would be negative, and that end would be positive. What about a carbon to carbon bond? Well, obviously, that's like my identical twins. The electronegativity difference is zero. So that pair of electrons is being shared equally, and there is no dipole. So I'm not going to draw an arrow pointing to either of the atoms. Now, it's possible to calculate what is known as percent ionic character of a bond. This is a relative measure of how much sharing there is. Essentially, um, as the electronegativity difference increases, the percent ionic character increases because there's a less sharing, there's more of a transfer, and the bond becomes less covalent. Likewise, if the percent ionic character decreases, the bond becomes more covalent and the electron pair is shared more equally. The breaking point here is about 1.7. If the difference is 1.7 or greater, the percent ionic character is above 50%, and we would call that an ionic bond, if we were basing it upon ionic character. 
if the electronegativity difference is less than 1.7, then its percent ionic character would be less than 50%, and we would classify it, if we based it on ionic character, as a covalent bond. Now the difference in electronegativity in HF, as you recall, H was 2.1, fluorine was 4.0, the difference is 1.9. So based on the chart above, how would we have to classify the bond between HF? Well, the percent ionic character would be above 50%. So above 50%. So we would say that that would be mostly ionic. Now, it is, a, it is considered to be a covalent bond because they're sharing that pair. But since that pair is not being shared as equally as others, we would classify it as a very strong polar covalent bond. Now, how does that explain the bond length being shorter? Remember? Well, if my fluorine has a negative charge and my hydrogen has a positive charge, what do opposites do? Opposites attract, and that's why the bond length between HF is smaller than what we would predict, because of this shared pair not being shared as equally as we would expect. One end ends up having a negative charge, the other end up, ends up having a positive charge, and they pull a bit closer together than the predicted bond length. Okay? All right. Let's do another Lewis structure just for fun, and, and then we'll move on. What if I had to draw the Lewis structure for Cl2? Well, let's see here. Um, chlorine, let's find my periodic table, is in group 17. So members of group 17 each have seven valence electrons. Chlorine's configuration is with 3s2, 3p5. So each chlorine has seven valence. I have two chlorines, seven valence apiece. So I have 14 valence electrons that will be drawn in my Lewis structures. To draw this, I'm going to put the CLs next to each other and put a pair between them. That's my shared pair. That's two of the 14 valence electrons. Two of them are being shared. Then I will complete the octet around each chlorine atom, giving this chlorine atom a total of four pairs, and this chlorine atom to the left a total of four pairs. Have I used my allotment of 14 valence? Let's count. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. I have. I've used 14 valence electrons. They share one pair. Now, what uh, shape would this molecule have? Well, whenever you have only two atoms bonded together, we call that shape linear. Let me build that really quickly for you. Let me grab my molecular models here. And we'll generally represent the halogens with green balls here. And we'll put a shared pair between them. And that's my intramolecular bond between the chlorine atoms. They're sharing one pair, and that shape is what we call linear. In fact, all diatomic molecules, all molecules made up of only two atoms, will have a linear shape. That's all they can be. They can't have any other shape. Would this guy be polar or nonpolar? Think about that for a minute. Remember how you determine that. Is there a dipole? Is there a difference in electronegativities? Of course not. They're both chlorine atoms. They're like my identical twins. They're going to share that pair perfectly. So if they share that pair perfectly, there's no dipole. And so as a result, the molecule is not polar. Does that mean that all two atom molecules are nonpolar? And the answer to that is no. Let me give you an example. What if I replace this chlorine with, we'll take one off of this molecule here, with a hydrogen? Well, it's diatomic. We have two atoms there. It's linear. We have two atoms there. Is there a dipole? Absolutely. There's a difference in electronegativities between chlorine and hydrogen. If there is a dipole, that means that the molecule is polar. So this diatomic molecule would be polar. Okay? All right. Next time we talk, we're going to talk about molecules with more than two atoms. So far, we've only drawn Lewis structures 
four molecules with two atoms, we're going to get up to three and four and even more than that. So stay tuned. Bye-bye.